but Shannon, mm -hmm. but um, you know, here's the 700 plus mm -hmm. complaints that we've gotten on unemployment issues, mostly people having to repay tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. back in unemployment benefits. But I just want to read a couple to you. I mean, this person asked that they had to repay $16,000. Uh, back to the DWD, uh, other person over $10,000. Another person says, I'm frantic, wondering how I'm going to provide, survive on what I bring home a month. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this is really stressful. These are people's families, their mm -hmm. livelihoods. I mean, they're losing homes, cars, and now they've got this debt that they're in. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from clients? So what I'm hearing is anywhere from 3,000 on the low end to 33,000 on the high end. Uh, and it's often months and months and months after they started receiving that they get this determination letter of, you know, as you said, tens of thousands of dollars to have to pay this back. And they're, they're frantic. They, they call us, you know, seeking advice on how to go through the processes because, you know, I, I haven't gone through that process as far as, you know, personally on the appeal level, but doing it for clients, I can see where it could be confusing for people, you know, jumping through the hoops to get the appeal in in time, it's kind of a short time to turn it around, um, go through the ALJ. They don't understand that it's a little bit of a more informal than your typical court setting uh, and things of that nature. And it's, it's extremely stressful for these people. You can actually hear it through the phone uh, when we take these phone calls and we get dozens, if not a hundred of them by now, um, just the, probably this year alone. Wow. In the last couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. Has it skyrocketed more in terms of who you're hearing from and the things you're hearing about? So, it, it, and we joke around out here, it seems to be cyclical, um, such as they're doing audits of this at the end of the month or maybe end of the quarter. So that's when it jumps. We'll get uh, a full day's worth of phone calls, maybe six, eight, 10, 12 phone calls in a single day of people, unemployment, unemployment, unemployment. And you know, we, we talk to them every time and we try to discuss their issues and see whether or not there's a viable appeal there for us to help with. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is, I mean, not everybody talked about repayment mm -hmm. uh, specifically, but majority, at least on our end, that's what we're hearing from people. Mm -hmm. What's the most common issue that you guys are hearing on unemployment benefits right now? So what we're hearing is obviously stemming from the repayment, but it is the appeal process itself. Okay, so the actual internal process to appeal the determination or the denial of it through the different steps uh, of the Department of Workforce Development and potentially into the Indiana court system. And that's what we hear the most because being attorneys, that's what we try to focus in on. We can't really go back and redo the wheel on the investigation that took place, but we can try to help people with the appeal process up through the different levels. Why are people having to repay? Can you, I mean, can you explain <laughs> that to me? Because we can't get answers from anybody on that. So the only thing I can think of is maybe a personnel shortage at the beginning of all this and pushing claims through without doing full investigations. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily what happened, but that's the only thing I can think of personally uh, is pushing a bunch of claims through just because I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it was somewhere with 3 million, 5 million claims uh, last year for unemployment due to the pandemic. And whether that be your traditional unemployment and the PUA or a combination thereof, mixed earner, that kind of thing. Just pushing those through and then maybe going back later and completing those investigations, looking at the, the factors involved. I mean, eh, maybe this person really didn't deserve it at the beginning or was not eligible at the beginning and now they're coming back months and months later and saying no, but they've already been paying that money. Mm. And I, you know, what's interesting is I, <laughs> I, I, all the other states around mm -hmm. us, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, I believe Michigan too, but uh, they have set up a system where they are waiving mm -hmm. um, any pandemic repayment that was made. Indiana has not done that yet, but you're telling me that there's maybe a little bit of a hole in the system or there's a possible way to get a waiver. Can you kind of break that down for me? Yeah, so Indiana does have a waiver for unemployment in the Indiana code. Uh, and the letters that we've seen from our clients come in, they've got two letters, the determination letter saying, no, you weren't eligible at the beginning of all this. So now months and months later, we want you to pay tens of thousands of dollars back. And then a second letter breaking down the actual amounts um, that were paid and you know what to pay. At the end of that second letter, 
is a section talking about the Indiana Code and how to be eligible for that. Now, I am not 100% certain that that would apply to the, the PUA, but to the mm -hmm. traditional, I'm fairly certain that it is. And those factors really break down and it may not be the easiest thing to get, but you receive the uh, monies from unemployment from the Department of Workforce Development through no fault of your own. So it cannot be a fraud situation or you know a gray area type yeah. thing through no fault of your own and during the pendency of an appeal or because of the error of the uh, department, they paid you this money that probably shouldn't have been paid in the first place and it's causing you a financial hardship. So yeah. it, there are several factors there and I would encourage people to actually look up the statute that's listed in okay. the letter okay. and look at that to see whether or not that they qualify for that. And this is, this is the determination letter. The, that is the repayment letter. Repayment the determination letter, letter okay. lays out the reasons that the case was determined. Got it. Okay. Either against the employer or against the person, or okay. in the case of just straight PUA benefits, whether or not the Department of Workforce Development itself has made the determination, no, you weren't eligible in the first place. Okay. So everyone who is being asked to repay should have received this letter. Is they that correct? should, yes. They should. All right. Or they can find it online? Is that what they should be looking for? So the portal system that the Department of Workforce Development set up is what I think that they use the majority of the time. Now I still receive mail when I do appeals and things of that nature because I don't have access to my clients portals because I don't want their passwords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to have that. Uh, but clients should be able to get on or individuals should be able to get on their portal. Remember your password, remember your login and check it if you're on there pretty much daily, especially if something like this is going on because the turnaround time on these appeals is so short. We're talking for the initial appeal, I believe it's 10 days. For the subsequent appeal up to the full review board, I believe it's 15 days, and that's a real short time, especially if you're not going to fax it and you're going to mail it. That's just, I mean, what's mail taking these days? Three, three days? We've had mail last year during the pandemic taking two weeks sometimes to get from here to the northern part of the state. So yeah, definitely And it's possible pay attention. you can, lose that appeal if you don't mm -hmm. have certain information. We found that from several people where mm -hmm. they there was a small error that they made or maybe they didn't give the exact information mm -hmm. that was needed and therefore they were denied and having to still <laughs> repay all this money. But something I want to point out, so this, this waiver, it, this does not specifically say for the pandemic, for, it, for, for, for but you're saying that this could be something worth trying if you received pandemic unemployment benefits. It could be an option to try. Uh, you know, there's no guarantee that you're gonna receive it, even if it does apply, but it's something to try. Um, you know, hopefully that the department would take a look at that and see that the financial need is there and that people cannot pay, you know, people who've just lost their job and lost maybe a car, maybe they lost both jobs if they're a two earner income, they're struggling with childcare and everything else. And now to come back and say, hey, this lifeline we gave you was just really fictitious and now we want all that money back and there could be potential penalties on top of that if you stretch it out over time i know that from my years of debt collection back in the back in the day um it was that they would come and take your state refund check and things of that nature i don't know if that's still what they do or how they even plan on collecting on this because mm -hmm. you know you go to somebody just a normal person and say hey pay me thirty thousand dollars back and that person just throws their hands up there's just no way so i mean let's talk about that because mm -hmm. you mentioned child care, people having mm -hmm. to pay their mortgage, right? They've mm -hmm. lost their job. More and more people have written into us saying, I'm considering hiring an attorney. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you probably don't work for free mm -hmm. <laughs> or no, most don't. employment attorneys do not, mm -hmm. right? So that's an extra fee mm -hmm. that they are now having to pay on top of that. I mean, what, what are you, what can people do if they can't necessarily afford someone like you right now and they are afraid of getting stuck in that situation where they are going to have to pay that mm -hmm. money back. So my, my biggest piece of advice to people on the phone is always, always, always pay attention to the correspondence you are receiving. All right. Make sure that you are receiving that correspondence. Even if you don't get it in the mail, make sure you're checking your portal. Okay. So you have it and you know your deadline and then get that appeal in before the deadline. You miss that deadline. You're pretty much out of luck. Okay, that's the number one piece of advice I give people. Number two is to go back and look at what happened, find out what the real determination reason was from the determination letter and see how your facts play into that. And then if you cannot hire an attorney, try to write the best appeal that you can instead of just sending in a letter saying, I appeal. 
so that you've got some information. Yeah. And then when you get that appeal in, it could be upwards of months mm -hmm. to actually get to the administrative law judge on the first level appeal. We had, we've had some that, if I remember correctly, one was appealed by the employer in August of last year and the mm -hmm. appeal hearing was in April of this year. So that's, that's a good chunk of time, eight months. Is, and you know, people are not getting benefits mm -hmm. during that chunk of time, right? So they're wait, I mean, I've had people who said, you know, I went in a month ago and they said, you know, wait for your court date. Mm -hmm but I still haven't received a court date. I mean, that whole three weeks or however long it's taking to get in the courtroom and do the appeal, I mean, that's still time that they're not receiving any kind of money, right? Mm -hmm. And they still are, they can't find a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, so kind of what's your response to that? I mean, is the state, are they making a mistake with the majority of the people they say is quote unquote fraud? So I don't, I don't know about the whole fraud concept. I think a lot of these that are getting denied are not necessarily allegations of fraud. Um, we have seen those as well where there are allegations of fraud, people who actually had jobs and were still applying saying that they hadn't made any money that week and that kind of stuff. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a different question than just mistakes, okay? Such as you just weren't eligible, you quit your job to stay at home or because you were afraid of the pandemic and you may not be, an, uh, you may not be eligible because the job was still there. Right, and they were taking precautions and things of that nature. Um, as far as you know, what to do in that scenario, I think that you, you still just gotta follow the process. There's no way to force the state to go faster on these things. I know that they've been looking for more and more and more people to handle the appeals uh, with the ALJs. I know that they've tried to find you know, attorneys to come in and contract to be an ALJ for the state. And I, I don't know how successful that's been, but if they don't have the ALJs, and these hearings can take, I've had hearings take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, typically uncontested things, upwards of four hours when there's a lot of documents to go through and things of that nature. Um, so it, they just may not have the manpower or person there to actually hear the appeal, and that's why it's taking so long. And then not getting paid during the pendency of that, you know, don't give up. Uh, that, that's what we've told people several times. Don't give up because if it comes out in your favor, then you're going to get that chunk of money. Now, it doesn't help you out now. You know, you're not paying rent now or mortgage now. You're not putting food on the table now based on that money. But down the road, hopefully, if you win, you'll you'll actually get that in one lump sum or broken out. So break down um, some of your cases that you have okay. right now with with a, with a few of your clients. So one seen. one client is had transferred from being a full time employee, as we call them, a W two employee to a 1099 contract. That's what she wanted to do. Um, she is in the healthcare realm, so she was going around uh, and helping different clinics out uh, based upon her licensure. And somehow, when she filed for uh, unemployment, they took it as against the employer that she'd left and made a determination based on that instead of under the pandemic, uh, the PUA system, and that just completely went into a quagmire. She has appealed that twice I helped with one of the appeals. She did the appeal on her own the first time. And the first one, it seems, has just gone into the ethereal realm. It just doesn't exist. Um, she sent it in, you know, timely. I think she sent it in by fax, maybe a day or two early. And she spent time and time and time calling them to see, by them I mean the Department of Workforce Development, um, trying to see where this was and finally came out, oh, we didn't receive it. So that, that gets me to another important concept on these things is when you do send these in, if you're sending it by fax, make sure to keep that success sheet or, you know, go sheet or whatever. Keep the receipts. Yeah, exactly. So that you can prove it. If you're sending it by mail, you're in a lot different boat because you don't have that, that piece. Even if you do it by certified mail, you may not get it there in time and things of that nature. So fax is probably best and keep that, keep that receipt. Uh, on another one, um, from the initial determination, it just looked like they said that he didn't fall under any of the categories for PUA, despite the fact that he was a carpenter, handyman type person, um, which you know traditionally is a 1099. You have your own business type concept, and you go and you do work on projects here and here and here. And it just so happened that he was from a different state, and it, it was kind of weird on that nature. And we got that one successfully resolved for him. Uh, another one was a, a, a truck driver who actually tested positive for COVID and there were some, some issues with that as to whether or not they terminated him or not during that time period. And we were successful in getting that one, you know, to where he didn't have to repay anything. I think that was 17. Actually, the last two I said were 17 and the first one was 19. 
thousand dollars. So I mean, wow. this is we're not talking about you know minuscule amounts of money. We're talking about you know for some people after taxes, it's their entire paycheck uh, for a year even. So that's it, it can really be a, a massive burden on these people, especially if you you know if you're the sole uh, earner of the household type concept. Yeah. Do you think that Indiana needs to put in some kind of law? some kind of waiver system specifically for PUA? I think they do. Um, I think that if the Department of Workforce Development wants to collect on fraudulent payments, perfectly fine. You know, that's that's fraud, go get that. On these mistakes, even the PUA mistakes, I think that it should be a little bit more streamlined. I think there should be more information out there given to these individuals, whether it be by letter or not. I don't know what that specific information is, but I know that there should be more information because that's, that's one of the the most anxiety producing things for the people who call us is there's no information. And when they call the Department of Workforce Development, at the beginning of this, some people were telling us it was hours on the phone just to get a hold of somebody. And then they would get some information, call back three days later, talk to somebody else, completely different information. Okay. And that could just be that, you know, during that time period, things were so frantic, people were trying to catch up, nobody knew which way was up. Yeah. Really? Well, they're not even answering us. Yeah, that doesn't We, we call every day. We mm -hmm. email every day. Mm -hmm. And we can't even get... Can't get an interview. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. We can't even get that information that from doesn't, them. That doesn't shock me. They've mm -hmm. been silent on that. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of people that are calling you guys mm -hmm. would... And it's not going to obviously be every single case, but would you say most of the cases that you've seen, people have a legitimate case where they can really win? Somebody's I would say that it's a fair amount. Uh, some of them... No, and, and we're candid with people around here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just this isn't something that we believe that we can argue successfully on your behalf. But a fair amount of people have a reason to have gone out on unemployment other than I just don't want to work, which is, you know, the old trope that you're going to be lazy because you're on unemployment. Um, but that is not what we typically see. Typically, if it's something that's a little bit in the gray area of yes or no is typically because I left because a family member is considered to be highly sensitive, asthma, smoking, obesity, something of that nature, per the original CDC guidelines back in March, May, that time frame, you know, and I didn't want to bring it home to them. Okay, that's a little bit more of a gray area in my opinion, as compared to somebody who, hey, I got COVID and then, you know, subsequently I took time off and they they got rid of me and now I want unemployment while I'm looking for another job. Well, now I can't find it because in this area it's been like restaurants, it's been decimated. Bars have been decimated by the fact that you can't have people there. So there's no job. So obviously COVA, uh, COVID, 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 <laughs> PUA naturally flow from that. So those people, I think, yeah, we can, we can argue that day in, day out. Yeah. Um, on, on, on your end, um, mm -hmm. I mean, what's it like? For you as an attorney, because I mean, you, you know, obviously you're going through the paperwork, but mm -hmm. I mean, you hear these stories mm -hmm. on a personal level and you hear the level of anxiety and mm -hmm. the stress that people are going through. Um, I mean, what's it been like on, on your end to see some of the situations that have come out after going through what a year and a half mm -hmm. of, of this pandemic and it's still kind of tailing off now, but I mean, I, what's it been like for you? Frustrating, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, hearing these complaints, and I don't think we've got 700, but we've had, you know, 100 or hundreds. Um, it's frustrating because you can see where these people are coming from. You know, they were go to work, come home type people, you know, making a paycheck and paying their bills and things of that nature. And now, as I told you earlier, that you can hear it through the phone, their anxiety and their frustration with the system and knowing that there's not a terrible amount that we can do, you know, even as attorneys here, to force the state into moving faster for these people in the scenarios where they, you know, supposed to have payments. We've heard people that were deemed eligible who didn't receive payments for a month or so, um, or maybe even two months on those ones. So that's eight weeks or 8.6 weeks on a 4.3 uh, month. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's really frustrating because, you know, they're looking to us you know, here's employment attorneys, uh, or people who handle unemployment issues to really help them out and guide them. And we really don't have any more information on some of these topics than what they have. We can help them with the appeals, but getting the state to actually move faster, to make decisions faster, to 
go back and maybe even look at their investigations a little bit. It's just, it, it, yeah, your hands are tied. Yeah. And that's always frustrating when you're, in a, you're an attorney and you're like, yeah, I really, your, your situation is awful. I'm sorry that it's happening to you, but there's just nothing I can do for you right now. What do you want to see from the state? I would love for the state to look at the way that they're doing these determinations. Um, and if there's not allegations of fraud or even provable instances of fraud, maybe make the determination, and I don't know about the state budget or anything of that nature, maybe make the determination that this was a, a really bad event. It was nationwide, global-wide issue. And maybe cut people a break, okay? just you're going to cause more problems than you're going to help with this. Um, and obviously I don't know all the budgetary issues and all that kind of stuff. But it, you know, from my point of view, from just a tax paying citizen here in Indiana, you may want to cut these people a break if you can't prove fraud.